Hey guys, my name is Gloria and welcome back to my channel. The lighting is weird. Um, it's very sunny today and my face is very white. That helps. I suppose I could sit like this for a while. Um, thank you so much for joining me again. Uh, today I want to talk about the three books that I was supposed to read for my birthday sort of celebration that were all published in 1993. There's a Stephen King, there's a Margaret Atwood, and there is a Richard Lehman. Very quickly, I just want to share a couple of cool art pieces that I got recently. The lighting's gonna go so weird. Um, so these were all, these are prints from an artist called Andres Strom, who works in Liverpool but is uh, from Latvia, I think. Um, I went over to get a really cool tattoo. I'll put a little picture of it beside me here um, of Beyonce. But he does really cool uh, prints as well. So I ordered a couple. Here is a very cool one. You can see it of um, Freddy Krueger, the Krueger himself. I'm a huge Linkin Park fan. So here's one of Chester. Or I peed Chester and I couldn't resist the striped menace himself. He likes to add extra eyes and stuff so I thought I'd just uh, share a couple of those cool horror-ish paintings. Uh, so yeah you should check out Andres Strom if you're looking for some cool art prints. On to the three books that I should have talked about two months ago but didn't get the chance to. The first one that I did read was a short story collection called Nightmares and Dreamscapes by Stephen King. It's quite a long collection. All of these books were quite long. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many stories are in it, but there are quite a few. There's a few that are quite long. And there is also a screenplay uh, in the middle of it as well. So, in general, um, it's got your classic sort of Stephen King-ness to it. Um, a few that stood out for me. It's a very strange one called uh, The Ten O'Clock People about smokers. Uh, the Ten O'Clock People who are people who meet outside uh, their office building at 10am um, to have a cigarette. And it reminded me a lot of They Live, which I recently watched weird conspiracy theory people not being what they appear to be kind of thing. Dolan's Cadillac was another one that stood out to me. It was quite long. It's about this guy trying to get revenge on this mafia boss who led to the death of his wife by uh, trying to bury his town car um, in the desert while he's still in it. That one was really sort of involved, it was quite long and you really did get drawn into that one. Quite interesting, The Night Flyer, uh, this guy works for this paranormal magazine and there's some rumour going around that there's a vampire of some kind um, taking a private plane and... I'm so wide I keep messing up the light. And um, stopping off airports, private airports and killing people. Uh, one that I really liked and other people uh, have mentioned this to me as well Suffer the Little Children it's just absolutely perfect for me it absolutely made my blood run cold for a couple of moments in that story it's quite short it's about this very strict sort of matronly teacher who doesn't take any nonsense from her young children I'd say they're like 8 to 10 years old um, but she starts to notice that they're acting very strangely and when she turns her back in the reflection of her glasses she can see their faces change and it's just really creepy, really gets under your skin. I will absolutely be reading that one again for sure. But there were a few that didn't 100% sit right with me. Um, I made um, a TikTok about this. Um, if anyone's on TikTok, I post a lot of various random things, uh, sometimes about books though. Um, so I posted this about me reading um, some of this and some of the weird things I read in it and one Stephen King fan got uh, quite annoyed at me because he is a legend. Um, 
Yes, he, he is, but he can also write badly sometimes. Um, one of the sort of nitpicky things that other people might not pick up on but that just sort of jarred with me was one particular story. Um, they have a hell of a band, I think it's called, uh, where this couple finds themselves, themselves lost and they drive into this town and they seem to recognise everyone in the town and at one point the, the woman in the couple has a dream where there's a jukebox filled with blood, very Stephen Kingy, um, but she's talking to this teenager in the dream and for absolutely no reason he flicks one of her nipples unkindly. Um, just a weird, weird thing that I noticed there. Um, one of the stories in the collection will haunt me till the day that I die, but not for the right reasons. It's a strange story. Uh, I believe it's called Dedication and it is about a black woman who works as a housekeeper in a hotel and she is telling her friend that her son has just published his first book and it's doing really well and he dedicated the book to her. And I'm going to spoil the story here so if you haven't read it yet you can skip until I put up the next book. But the story is of this pregnant black Back when she just got pregnant, this pregnant black woman goes to this bruja, this witch for advice and she is given some advice and takes it and the advice is that she should go and eat the semen <clears throat> of this old white man who comes and stays at the hotel who is uh, a famous published writer himself and this will make him the natural father, uh, sort of the magical father of her child. So she goes in to change his sheets every morning and scoops it off with her fingers and eats it and um, that's how her son becomes a published writer later in life. So there's a lot to unpack with that story. There's a lot of connotations, particularly with the race aspect with the just absolute biz bizarreness with it. Stephen King does get a lot of flack for how he writes women sometimes and um, that one is particularly odd. I would like to know his thought processes behind that and what he wanted to say about those characters. Um, that was weird. The collection had its, had its good points. I'd say th three, three and a half stars for me, but particularly that one with the, the children. Really creepy, really liked that one. The next one that I read was The Robber Bride by Margaret Atwood, and it is sort of a twist on a Brothers Grimm fairy tale called The Robber Bridegroom, who entices young women in to marry him so that he can kill them. Uh, this. I haven't actually read that one, although it is, I did look it up and it is quite short and it's online for free so I'll link it in the description down below, but the actual story follows these three women who meet every month um, to have lunch in a place called the Toxique and it's set in Canada and the reason that they're all friends is because they were all betrayed by the same woman. They all sort of vaguely knew each other in college but weren't really friends with each other uh, but they're all linked by this betrayal that happened to them. This woman who individually went to each of them and fucked up their lives in some way and so this story begins with them all meeting up for lunch everything seems normal. They're reminiscing about how they went to this woman's funeral. She did die, they were told about it and um, I think one of them even has her ashes in her basement and so they all think they're free of her weirdness until she walks into the restaurant and she's not dead anymore seemingly. And so they're all freaking out and they all have to try and figure out what actually went on. Is she coming back for them? Was she really dead in the first place or did she lie about that because she seems to lie about a lot of things and the book sort of goes through each of the women's stories from their childhood up to sort of explain them as a person and explain the things that they've been through and 
also exactly how this woman Xenia is her name um, came into their lives asked them for help gained their confidence and then stole their man in various different ways for the different women this woman is quite brutal she is quite cruel um, each of the women are really interesting they are very different one of them is very rich but she came from poor beginnings one of them is a professor um, of war she studies war she is obsessed with old wars she has a little table uh, down in her basement that she puts props down um, to reenact wars and she's obsessed with the past and even has a, a weird habit of speaking backwards and doing everything backwards and the other woman is very different from these two quite intelligent strong stoic woman she is very spiritual she doesn't like to hear bad energy she doesn't like to hear negative words negative things and she's all into helping people and that's one of the ways that she was pulled into Xenia's grasp. I was expecting some supernatural elements with this book and I can't actually say that there weren't. Just the the story of Xenia um, as seen through these three women's eyes is quite otherworldly. There's, there's something weird about her and I was expecting um, some sort of big reveal at the end but there wasn't but it still felt like there was something underlying there that just wasn't being explicitly said, um, which is fine. I kind of liked the the ambiguous ambiguity in this um, story. Xenia is sort of kept at arm's length and it just, it lends some mystery to her while you get to see so much of the three other women and the men that they are in love with. And it is sort of a question of, did did Xenia really ruin their relationships or did she just show them how crappy the men in their lives were because they were so easy to manipulate, so easy to take away. But yeah, I really liked it. It's my first Atwood book. I will absolutely be reading um, more of her stuff. I have an e-version of The Handmaid's Tale that I'm going to get to. And she also has a masterclass um, on the masterclass series, so I will be watching that as well. The third book that I read was Endless Night by Richard Lehman. Um, this was my first Lehman novel. Uh, I ended up liking it, so if you have any other novels of his that you think I should read, please let me know. It is the story of Jody, who is a 16-year-old girl who stays over at a friend's house one night and they are woken by signs of intruders in the house. Her friend wants to go out and see if someone's there and as she opens the bedroom door she is murdered right in front of Jodie. There's a gang of absolute weirdos who have broken into the house to kill the family just for fun but Jodie being the fantastic character that she is and also a police officer's daughter is able to get to her friend's little brother's room and to get him and herself out of the house and away from these people but this gang is the type of gang that do not leave witnesses for any of their crimes and there is one person in particular who is being blamed for them getting away and so he has to find them, get rid of them uh, or him and his own family are going to be killed by this gang that he's a part of. So the whole story takes place over the course of about 36 hours or so I think. Uh, that's why it's called Endless Night. It was a bit of a roller coaster for me. There were bits that I just didn't think sat right but then he kind of pulled them back and there was a bit bit more explanation to it. It made a bit more sense uh, but there were a few things in the story that I just don't think should have been there just didn't really work for me. Uh, it is a very violent story. It's reminiscing about um, sexual assaults that happen and one of the main reasons that this guy is so obsessed with finding these two kids is because he is so obsessed with Jodie herself. He 
wants her and he's absolutely obsessed with her and can think of nothing else for all the time that he is after them. Um, so we get the book from the perspective of Jodie and this guy that's after her. Strangely, um, his parts are being taken from him recording. So right after they eventually get away after running out of the house and everything, he has to lay low because there are cops everywhere and he breaks into this couple's house and murders them and finds a tape recorder. Excuse me. Thank you. Finds a tape recorder and starts talking because he knows his life's pretty much over. The gang's gonna kill him regardless. Um, so he just starts talking about everything they've done, how they started and what he's planning to do to Jodie. I did end up liking the book. Um, it's the type of book that has a lot of layers to it that speaks a lot about our our society, our view on violence, our view on sex and violence, our view on young girls, young women and these predators that go after them um, so frequently. really like Jodie as a character. I was confused from the outset by the younger brother of her friend that she saves. He, from the very beginning, he's not right. There's something very weird about him. He's not your average teenager. While his family are being killed in the same house as him, while there is a dead body near him, I mean all of this happens in a matter of hours and he's still constantly being this little horny teenager who has a crush on Jodie and is trying to look down her t-shirt, trying to see her get changed, trying to manipulate her into touching him and kissing him because he's grieving. At the very end of the book you do see that he, he definitely isn't your average teenager um, but for most of the book I did kind of think that he was supposed to be a normal teenager and it just didn't sit right with me. There is one point where he just He's alone with Jodie and he's just talking to her and he mentions that um, when he was at school a friend showed him a picture of women in a concentration camp in World War II who were lining up to go to the showers and um, he liked looking at them even though he knew that they were about to be murdered. Um, that didn't seem to faze him, he was still excited by it which was disturbing for the reader. It was also disturbing for Jodie. A couple of things just didn't really make sense to me. Uh, one of them in particular, the the whole start of the book, the whole um, first attack in the house and everything is seen from Jodie's perspective and she is staying over at her friend's house and she is a 16 year old girl and they're woken up in the middle of the night, she's wearing like a night dress, she has to run, no shoes or anything, they have to get out of there because someone's trying to kill them. Cool. It, we go through all these different things, they try to get to a neighbor's house, they have to run away from these people, they're almost caught a few times. Um, it isn't until we get the perspective of the guy that was running after them that we're told that she wasn't wearing any underwear which seems like a small thing, but it's really not. And it really was a little bizarre to me. If you're a 16 year old girl, you are constantly aware of your body, of your private parts. You're constantly being told to be aware of it. Um, you definitely would not, unless there were some mitigating cir circumstances, you definitely would not be sleeping in just a t-shirt in someone else's house where they have a dad and a brother who you know fancies you. Just not not going to happen. Um, when she goes to try and get the brother out, he's like hugging her around the waist and stuff. She never mentions that she's not wearing underwear. Um, she's leaping over walls, climbing over things. It just it's something that a teenage girl would be so incredibly aware of even in circumstances like that particularly in circumstances like that so that bit just didn't, didn't really make sense to me um another part that i 
This part actually I thought was quite funny. You could take this as being part of um, an unreli unreliable narrator because we are getting the killer's perspective from these tapes that he's recording himself. So he could just be lying his ass off. Um, but when he goes to this house and finds the tape recorder, he murders the woman and then he decides that it would be a good idea for him to wear a disguise to get past the cops so he can try and find these kids he's looking for. Um, so he decides to put on her clothes. Fine. He decides to scalp her and wear her scalp as a wig. And he decides to put on a few touches of makeup. And he is then convinced that he is an incredibly attractive woman. And by all accounts, it seems like he is, even though he shouldn't be. Um, the husband of this woman comes home and thinks that he's one of his wife's friends just sitting in the house. Uh, he encounters lots of people he seems to get whistled at and stuff. And maybe this is just showing how, how crazy the guy was, but I was just, I was laughing quite frequently, imagining this buff, hairless guy because he did, he was completely shaved from head to toe except for his eyebrows, um, wearing a, an oozing skin scalp with scraggly blood curdled hair coming out of it and bits of makeup. Um, makeup is hard for anyone who doesn't know, even the most simple makeup, <laughs> even knowing what is what in a makeup bag um, is difficult. So any man who has never had any dealings with makeup before, you're gonna look like an absolute insane person um, if you try and put anything on your face. You might think it's easy and it's, it's, it's not. So I was just imagining this weird guy walking around in a skirt with a scalp on his head and just looking like Pennywise or something, but seemingly getting whistled up because he was so attractive. Very strange, but I did end up liking. I did end up liking um, all three books to some extent. I would give this one four stars. I would give *The Robber Bride* probably four stars as well. They're the kind of books that I wish I'd read in when I was in college studying English. Um, I feel like there's a lot of layers, particularly in the last two novels, where I could have really written some interesting essays on them if I'd had the chance but uh, unfortunately I did not. I could write them now but I'm not going to because I am lazy but they are very interesting. They do really make you think about a whole host of different things. So yeah I definitely am glad that I read those. If you have any recommendations of books that came out in 1993 or any year since then you can let me know. Um, I might do a little series when I have time in the future. I might do a little series of reading like a book from every every year in the last couple of decades just to see. I know um, Priscilla, uh, a frequent commenter in my videos, thank you very much, um, she was interested to know if anything in these books was very similar because they all came out in the same year and I don't think there was really other than the fact that there there was no technology mentioned, um, just absolutely no smartphones, no, not not even cell phones at all, um, no internet spoken of. It was like it just didn't it didn't exist because it didn't exist. But it's just uh, yeah, that was the only sort of thing that I noticed. But other than that, they were all sort of different, all focused on different things and had different things going on in the background. So. Yeah, it is kind of interesting that they're they're not more similar to be honest. But um but yeah, so that was the three books that I read from the year of nineteen ninety three, the year I was born. So thank you so much for joining me. I shall be back very soon with a couple of tag videos as well. So thank you so much. Uh if you like what I'm doing here, you can like and subscribe down below and I shall see you in the next video.